Happy Mother's Day, everyone. It's good afternoon now, isn't it? It's not good morning. If you take your notes out this morning, I, uh, this afternoon, I'd like to speak to you on Mother's Day, one heartbeat at a time. I realize that this is a day for many people, and maybe this might be true for you today, that there can be a bevy of mixed feelings that you have about the relationship with your mother. I hope that uh, what I have to say today is helpful and encouraging to you. It's true that our mothers are extremely important on our development. They bring a certain aspect of God's image to bear on our own souls and on our own personalities. A mother's influence on her children shows up in how a child thinks and feels about themselves. This is what we call a child's sense of self. It is a child's overall judgment of themselves. And depending on how well we help them with this, we want them to feel that he or she likes their particular self. Now, high self-esteem is not a high, noisy conceit, but it is a quiet sense of self-respect and a feeling of self-worth. When you have it deep inside... You're glad that you're you. Conceit is a whitewash to cover low self-esteem. With a health, healthy sense of who you are and who God made you to be, you're glad to be you, which means you don't waste time and energy impressing, impressing others. You already know you have value. In other words, when you see somebody trying to be what they're not and they're working really hard at trying to impress you, you just know that they lack that strong sense of value. Now, here's the importance of what I want to share with you this afternoon. The three heartbeats that I want to share with you will help you, first of all, as a mother, to learn to connect to God's heart so that you can connect your heart to your child's heart. But this isn't just about mothers. This is about men. This is about women. This is about young people. These three heartbeats are extremely important so that we can relate uh, to one another. Tanya, it's good to see you. Everybody laugh. No, no, no. Listen, everybody laugh a little Soren and his, the little cheese meister that went like this. That's her little guy. So I'm going to tell a story on you in a moment. So it's a good story, though. As you communicate this healthy heartbeat to your child, it will enhance and encourage your child to have this positive sense of themselves. So before I start, I want to just share with you why is a healthy sense of self so important to your child and actually for every one of us today? Because your child's judgments of themselves it influences the kind of friends they choose, how they get along with others, and the kind of person that they will marry, and how productive they will be. How they perceive themselves affects their creativ creativity, their intellect, and their ability and stability, and it actually determines whether they're going to be a leader or a follower. I think you'd agree with me. We need more leaders today. We really do. And it has everything to do with our ability, and mamas, I'm focusing on you today, how you can speak into your child's life. Their feelings of self-worth form the very core of their personality, and it determines how they will use the abilities and their aptitudes. I think Moses' mother did a pretty good job with him. What do you think? Their attitudes towards themselves have a direct bearing on how they will live the different aspects of their lives, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, vocationally, intellectually, and physically. And most of all, I think, and most important, is how they view themselves sets them up for how they will learn to respond to Jesus Christ and what he has done 
on their behalf on the cross. So what we're talking about this afternoon is incredibly important. So I want to talk to you about three heartbeats that can transform your child, three heartbeats that can transform your life, three heartbeats that as you learn to connect and communicate with other people in your lives, it will transform their lives. Here's the first heartbeat. Would you write it in your notes? It's the heartbeat of trust. Now, Philippians chapter 2, 19 to 22 says this. Paul's writing. If the Lord is, Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you're getting along. Now, notice what he says about Timothy. I have... No one else like Timothy, who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. And wouldn't you say that pretty much divides our culture? You're sitting here this afternoon. When you leave, you're either going to relate to others and put them first, or when you leave here today, you're going to think more about yourself. Even as you're sitting there and you're listening to this, your sense of self, if you have a strong sense of trust, then you're going, this is going to be really helpful to you. How can I develop that with others? If you're thinking more about yourself, there's a self-centeredness and a self-obsession. This can be a very helpful thing for you to make that decision to be more other-oriented. You can see the trust. Oh, let's see. I, okay, all the other cares for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served with me in the preaching of the good news. You can see that Paul trusts Timothy. Why? Because somebody in Timothy's life developed this heartbeat of trust with him and for him. He says he's the only one on my team that genuinely cares about your welfare. Now, what separates Timothy from the rest of this group is his genuine care and for him helping them develop their relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul's indictment on the other people around him was they only care for themselves. They're self-centered. Timothy was Jesus-centered. Now, look at this heartbeat that Paul says Timothy shared. In verse 22, he says, the proof of Timothy's character and authenticity is that he served with me like a son would with his father. Now, you might be saying, Scott, you're ahead of the game because June 17th is Father's Day. But what I want you to look at is in 2 Timothy 1.5, we understand who developed this trusting heartbeat in Timothy so that he could serve along with Paul. Would you read 2 Timothy 1.5 with me? Let's begin. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. I just, this thing exploded off the page when I saw that connection. He said, the reason he could serve with me like a son does with his daddy is because his mommy and his grandmother built this heartbeat of trust. He learned that he could trust by their communication to him. And what I really like is how they generated their faith to him. He says, listen, I know Eunice, <laughs> and I know Lois. I can trust this boy because he's got that same genuine kind of fair care and faith. So out of this, look at letter A. The backbone of safety is trust. For there to be psychological trust, emotional trust, spiritual trust, relational trust, the backbone of safety is trust. And why is that important? See if you would agree with me on this. There's basically two motivations out of life. A child who has this strong sense of this heartbeat of trust, they're either going to function out of security and out of strength, or they will function out of fear. Check yourself out today. Just run a little test on yourself. Do you move towards things in confidence and courage, 
knowing that it's going to be okay and that God is with you? Or do you have a tendency to be apprehensive and you move away in fear? This heartbeat of trust, which is the backbone, helps you develop this kind of confidence in life. Now, most infants experience their needs as intense and immediate. They have a very low tolerance for frustration. It's kind of cute. Uh, a couple that's just been coming to church the last three, four weeks, they had their little son. He's probably four or five months. And he was in his little carrier just throwing a fit. <laughs> and I said, what's he frustrated about? He's hungry, and I can't feed him yet. Just kind of, it was a great little uh, illustration of this. Uh, children, little babies, low tolerance. They have diapers, they need them changed. The parent who schedules their baby's feedings to meet the child's needs, who respects the signals that the child is either hungry or full, introduces new foods gradually, weans slowly. Talking about weaning. Anybody see the Time Magazine cover? Uh, there's a big brouhaha. Uh, she's an uh, attractive gal, and she has one breast bare, and her three-year-old son is up on the chair uh, having a snack. And <laughs> there's just a conversation now culturally about, is that appropriate? I remember Kathy wanted, was so excited for me to meet her friend who's a therapist, and she had her five, six-year-old child there. And, you know, I'm just watching. Next thing I know, you know, down comes this, and child just helps herself. And I thought, this is unique. <laughs> and I must say, I was um, rather tense. So I just looked somewhere else until I could tell it was done. Um, it all helps the baby to feel safe. Gentle respect for an infant's way builds this quiet trust. Relaxed mothers add, in, add uh, to their infant's security. And I would say a relaxed mother at whatever age. Kathy's always made it a, a real, I think, impetus to be a calm mother. And you can see that impact on our kids. Uh, I, can be, I can have my moments of calmness. But it's a way of life for Kathy. Thank God, Kathy. And thank you that you're so calm. Some parents can be walking bundles of tension. And whether you know it or not, your children and your babies, they sense it. Did you know that little kids pick up the tensions between parents, spoken or otherwise? Tensions born of emotions unmet are quickly picked up by children. It's important to understand as a parent and just as an adult that it is possible to work through these things, and we need to because the safety of our children is so important. And I'm not just talking physical safety, but emotional and relational and psychological and spiritual safety. Now, trust is built in many ways. Letting your child know when and where you're going will help a child to build safety. Avoid sudden, unpleasant surprises. Things just like helping children uh, know that they're going to the doctor and what they can uh, expect, or a visit to the dentist or a visit to the hospital. And uh, I, I went and visited with uh, Tanya. She had a, an early uh, experience where she needed to go to the hospital. And so as we were talking, uh, they have a little boy, Soren. He's really a unique little boy. And she just mentioned about how she's shown him quite a few videos of babies coming out of a mama's womb. Three years old. So he's seen many births. And I said, why, why did you do that? Well, because he kept saying, as soon as my brother or sister comes out, I'm going to take him or her, and we're just going to go play. You know, he kind of had in his little mind, maybe, well, the little one, my sister or brother, will come out just like me at my age. And so at age three, he began to get this understanding that 
the little person that's going to be on arrival soon isn't going to be at his place. And I just really marveled at that because she took the time to build this quiet trust. Now, you're all pretty smart. What else do you think that will do for him? I think it's going to reduce his sense of being replaced. I think there will be a less tension about, look at me, look at me, look at me, because he's gotten this good understanding over and over and over and over and over again of what the little boy or little girl will be like. Safety is the backbone of trust. Look at letter B. Trust is created through emotional honesty. I think you'd agree with me. It's so easy to send mixed messages to our children and to each other, especially if we're not taught how to share and show our emotions. Many children are shamed for what they feel, and they keep their emotions, emotions repressed. I came from a, a pastor's home, and our home was fairly emotionally violent. And we were told in no uncertain terms that if you didn't like mom and dad's decisions or you had any negative thoughts, you never expressed it to them. You just didn't. And I was told more than once, if you don't get that look off your face, I'll knock it off your face. So if there's anything like, and you heard that, you went, now, we laugh because we know that that's a normal experience, but did you know that creates mixed messages for children? Let me give you an example. Tony comes home from school, and mom is upset and angry, so she is vigorously vacuuming the rug, and her jaw set, and she's like this, and Tony comes in and goes, immediately, what's wrong, mom? Nothing, Tony. Absolutely nothing. You know, she's going to rip the carpet up. Tony's first thought is, oh, no, she found the frog underneath the bed. And then he begins to wonder, uh, what else is she mad at? Oh, I hope she doesn't abandon me. I hope she doesn't reject me. All these feelings are flowing through. What could mama, what should mama have said? Tony comes home. She's, you know, what's wrong? You know what, honey? I just had a disagreement with a neighbor, and I'm upset. But I'm an adult. It's my issue. It's not your issue. And I'm going to get it taken care of. I'm so glad to see you. It's so great to have you home. How was your day? Could have diffused the whole issue. Now, why is this so important? You know that in the communication process, only 7% is made up of words. So that means if I do an excellent, well, no, if I do a superb, a superior, the best job in the world of sharing my words with you today, that's only 7% of the communication process. There's about 35 to 40% that has to do with tone, speed, loudness, softness. And did you know 55%? has to do with nonverbal. Isn't that amazing? So if I'm going to be congruent, and if you're going to be able to get as much out of what I have to say, because I believe God has wanted me to share this with you, I need to make sure that my body language and my tone and speed and words all match. That's how you get emotional authenticity and emotional honesty. And why is this so important? Why is the climate of trust so important to a child? And really, for all of us, I realize that for most of us here, most of us have trust issues. I've had people who come to church here, they won't even talk to me for the first four or five months because they've been so traumatized at home. They've had such negative church experiences. And the honesty, honesty is some of you that come, you hate God when you enter into this place. Who do I represent to you? The person you hate. I just talked with somebody today. He said, do you realize it took you five months before you'd even look at me? She said, I know. But she kept coming. So why is trust 
such an important issue because it says this to our children. You can look your child, you can look your spouse, you can look another person in the face and say, you can count on me to help you meet your needs. I'm not perfect, but you can depend on me to be honest with you, even about my imperfections. And then here's what's really cool. You look your child in the face and say, and it's okay for you to be imperfect with me too. Now your child, regardless of the age, will go, I understand that one. Right? If I give you, sweetheart, anything less than appropriate openness, I shortchange you. You are safe with me. This kind of attitude breeds love and respect. It gives a child the security to actually then enter into the world and be friendly and have an open manner with others because they've learned this way from you. Mamas, when you treat your children this way, daddies, men and women, when we respond to each other this way, you actually can change a life by one little heartbeat, the heartbeat of trust. If you're a mom here today, all of the hours and sacrifice you put into creating a safe place for your child, it's changing that child. I think you've noticed with me that the world can be a pretty unsafe place. But if it's safe inside, if I can trust God, and I can trust what he's put into me, and I can trust what you as my mother has put into me. Uh, how many were here last week to hear Joel speak? Or two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. You heard his story. Very powerful. Wasn't the most safe place to be in. But he's gotten himself around other men. And he's gotten himself around other women who have been able to do that. And that's the power of the local church loved ones. When we take this thing serious, not just the raising of our own children. I take the raising of your children very important. Most of you know that about me if you have a child. Your child comes into my sphere of influence. I'm either on my knees in their presence or I pay attention to them immediately. Oftentimes I'll pay attention to them first before I do you. Because I know if I'm paying attention to them, I'm paying attention to you. Trust. Look at the second heartbeat. It's the heartbeat of acceptance. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 says this. Accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Question, how has Jesus Christ accepted us? Romans 5, 8 says it this way. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners, while I was still estranged from him. I was antagonistic. I didn't care about him. Didn't believe he existed. He still came and gave his life sacrificially for me. Jesus Christ took God's wrath and his anger and his judgment that was due to my rebellion and due to my sin on himself. He's totally accepted us, loved ones, regardless of what we've done. He's made it possible for us to receive God's mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. He has removed judgment and he has removed condemnation from us. So how does that trickle down now into how we relate to our kids? Well, look at letter A here. Would you write in your notes, blame and negative judgment is at the core of spiritual and emotional problems. Blame and negative judgment is at the core. It's really incredibly important that each one of us see this and how we relate to our children, how we relate to our spouses, how we relate to ourselves. For some of us here, the, the conversations and the words that we use for ourselves, they are blaming, they are negative, they are self-contradicting. And when you do that, it just tears you up on the inside. Every time you tell yourself you're stupid, Every time you tell yourself you're not worthy, you don't measure up, you don't deserve this, 
That's really what Satan wants, to, wants you to believe. That somehow you are outside the scope of God's redeeming touch. Negative just, just, uh, judgments make us negative mirrors to our children. That's why in that song, that is so powerful for me, every little smile, you think about it. Some of us are pretty sober with our faces. When we come in, it's just... And I've had some of you say, oh, I'm feeling great inside. Well, tell your face that. <laughs> Why is that important? Because my face is the mirror that you see. You know, if I come in here today and I said, you know, it's just really, really great to see you all here. I mean, you just put a smile on my face. And you're going, where's the smile? I got the words right. But it lacks congruency, doesn't it? You're sitting here going, no, you don't. No, you don't care. So your body, your, your face is so important because it's the mirror. Well, look, this leads to letter B. Learn to respond, but suspend judgment. Learn to respond, but suspend judgment. What do I mean by that? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1 and 2, most people who are not believers, most people who have never read the Bible, they know this verse. I've heard this verse quoted on television by more non-believers. They don't even know where it's found. And they usually don't quote it correctly, but they know this verse. And here it is. Why don't you read it with me out loud? Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. What was Jesus talking about? It's always important when we interpret scripture. We, we have to keep it in the context. You can't just look at it and go, well, I know what that means. No, what, you, I don't know what something means until I can get to the reason and the intent of what the speaker said. So why did Jesus say this? What was he talking about? Well, when you put it in context, the specific Issue being judged is nowhere identified for us, but it has a broad application to it. The verb judge has a, has a number of different nuances depending on the context. The verb, the Greek word is krino, it means to judge, has a number of different nuances. So depending on the context, ranging from, ranging from ordinary discernment or evaluation to judicial litigation, to a bestowal of a reward, to the pronouncement of guilt, and to the absolute determination of a person's fate. Now, it's this issue that Jesus was talking about. He says, when he says, Scott, do not judge, what he's saying is, you're not to pronounce the guilt on somebody, and you're not to set absolute determination of a person's fate. Jesus said only God ultimately knows that. How many of us know the story of Jesus hanging on the cross? Two thieves. They deserved to be there. He didn't. One mocked Jesus. The other one said, dear son of God, please forgive me. It's what you call one of those last minute salvation experiences. He said, today I will meet you in paradise. He didn't say it to the other guy. He said it to that guy. So you might see people go, if there's anyone not getting into heaven, it's Scott. You don't know that. Yeah, there's fruit. There are things that we can have a pretty good sense of. But I love this fact that when we all stand before God, he's a just God. He's a fair God. He's a loving God. He knows. And he's always right. Some of you are too young, but you remember the, remember the little... Uh, Program Father Knows Best. <laughs> In this case, it's true. In parenting with each other, in parenting with each other, instead of judging each other, we're to share our responses and our feelings with each other. For children's safety, they need your real reaction. They need your response. They don't need judgment but they need your response so that they can keep their behavior within appropriate bounds. But they must be spared our labels. Let me give you a few examples here. Next slide. Thank you. 
When you say you're impossible, you are labeling that child or that husband or wife, and you're basically saying you're worthless. You're not going to change. You're impossible. What about saying something like this? I don't like all this bickering. You see the difference? You can feel it, can't you? Look at the next one. You're lazy. As opposed to, I'm concerned about your grades. How about this one? You're thoughtless. As opposed to, I will not pick up after you. That's your responsibility. You see the difference? If I go to Petra and just say, you're thoughtless. You're, you're just a big pig. I'm, I'm blaming him and I'm assessing judgment to him. But if I say, you know, Petri, I'm not going to pick up, up after you. Uh, you're, you're mature enough. You understand. This is your responsibility. And, and if he was my son, I'd say, I'm going to walk away now, and I trust you, and I know you're going to clean it up. I love you, son, and walk away. How about this one? You're a bad boy. You're a bad girl. Instead, it hurts little Timmy when he's pinched, and I don't like to see him hurt. You remove the judgment, you remove the label, and Timmy sits here and goes, yeah, I understand that. I was at my uh, sister's about a year ago, and she has uh, this little boy. We asked you all to pray for him. He had heart surgery, open heart surgery at about two months. Unbelievable. He made it out. And I'm telling you, this kid is a fiery pistol. You would never know unless you see this big, long string of uh, scars in his chest. And it was real cute. He, he started pulling his mother's hair on her arm, and it hurt her. And she wasn't responding to it. So I just leaned over, and I started pulling his. He looks at me and goes, that hurts. I go, I'm sure. Did you check with your mom? It hurt her, too. He stopped doing hers. But then he went back to it. So I did his again. And then he stopped. Then he started pulling mine. <laughs> so I just leaned over. Just said, I said, you're the cutest little kid. And I just pulled on his. And he goes, that hurts. And I said, well, stop. And he did, and I did. Dig this. He goes underneath the table. Because I have short pants on. He starts pulling the hair on my leg. So without saying a word to him, I just reached underneath the table and felt the hair on his head and just began to pull it a little bit. <laughs> and now I look like I'm crazy because I'm having a conversation with someone you can't see. He goes, let go of my hair. And I said, let go of mine. <laughs> and he did. And then he pulls it again. So I pull his. Now, I'm not pulling it out. I don't have a, you know, a batch of his hair. Just enough to send enough pressure to go, I would prefer you stop it. And finally, he did. And he comes out underneath the table, and he just goes. <laughs> and I smiled back at him, and we're buddies now. But I could have gone, you're a beast. You're a brat. Now, that's how I was raised. We spared labels. It took longer, and it hurt me a little bit, but we broke throat. What was I doing? I was treating him with acceptance, and I was moving away from judgments. Let me give you some more examples, because I think this is tough for us. At least it's tough for me. I have to frame this stuff in my head all the time. And I've, I've talked to you about this before, but you judgments, and we use I responses instead. No, any time you use the personal pronoun you, and then it's strong with adjectives like, you slowpoke, you're so messy, you're such a procrastinator. You're so sloppy. You're rude, even if it is rude what they're doing. If you label them and judge them that, that's how they begin to feel. And it disables their sense of safety. You're so selfish. You're so naughty. You could even do it this way. You're nice. You're good. I'll talk about that in a moment. You're bad. You're shameful. This is all judgmental by nature. Can you feel it? OK, so let me give you some you judgments. Let me give you some my responses. Here's a you judgment. You're such a slow poke. I'm concerned you're going to be late for school. Do you sense the difference? 
How about this one? You're messy. I won't clean up your cookie crumbs off the floor. That's your job. How about this one? How sloppy can you get? This clutter really bothers me. So you're being honest with your emotions. You're staying away from judgment. How about this one? You're a liar. I love this, guys. I can't count on your words when they don't match what you do. Isn't that beautiful? Can you see looking at your little kid, you know? And they've got chocolate all over their face. Did you eat one of those cookies? Never even saw the cookie. I don't know what the cookie tastes like. Really? How did that chocolate get on your face? I don't know. The chocolate monster attacked me last night in bed. Then you could just look at him with a nice little smile on your face, and you know what, sweetheart? I can't count on your words when they don't match your actions. There's chocolate all over your face. You ate the cookie. Yeah, I did. How'd it taste? Oh, it was good. Okay, then you do what you need to do. But How about this one? You dope. Don't you know any better? Let's go to the next one. You dope. Don't you know any better than to stay out of the street? To, you know, I'm really frustrated because I've repeatedly told you about the danger of playing in the street. I'm afraid you're going to be hurt. When we were in Pomona, uh, we, lived on a, we lived in a bad neighborhood, prostitution, drugs, um, drive-bys. Roger, you would have loved it there. Roger's a police officer. One day, our, our uh, male person who was Hispanic shows up in our street, and he looks absolutely white. I said, what happened, Danny? He said, there was a drive-by. I had to dive underneath the car as the bullets were spraying into the house. So that's kind of a flavor of where we lived. And Benny got out into the street. Man, I ran after him, and I pulled him out, and I'll have, have to tell I was shouting at him. I said, I'm so frustrated. How many times have I told you about staying out of the street? Do you know how I would feel if I had to come up and pick you up and you were dead? I'd be devastated. He's sitting here going, Benny, stay out of the street. Yes, got it. He never went back in the street. The heartbeat of trust and acceptance will transform your child and yourself and the people you relate to. Here's the heartbeat of trust, there's the heartbeat of acceptance, and here's our last heartbeat for the afternoon, the heartbeat of being cherished. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 says this. Even before God made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. The Bible says that you and I are not an afterthought with God. Before the world was created, that he loved you. And notice what it says there, that in, through Jesus Christ, he chose you to be holy and without fault. Wow. And he wanted to adopt you into his own family. Why? Because it brought him great pleasure. When you think of pleasure, doesn't, isn't that a good definition of cherished? I don't know about you. I grew up, I did never thought that I brought my parents great pleasure. And they just said I was a little beast and I was into trouble all the time. And there's probably good reasons for that, too. But it's something to bring pleasure. And the Bible says that you bring great pleasure to God. Have you thought of this before? Acceptance of your child is, is as important as it is. Acceptance, I think, is too mild when we consider that it's our responsibility to create an environment of love. For our children to really thrive, look at letter A. Children survive on acceptance. They thrive on being cherished. It's a big difference between the cherishing of a child and the accepting of a child. To cherish a child means they feel valued, precious, and special just because they exist. 
Now, I didn't tell Benny what to say, but did you catch that, his experience of Kathy communicating cherish, that he's cherished, she says, he said that when I call you on the phone, you just light up. It's like I'm the only person that exists. And I've lived with her for 35 years. I've watched her with our kids. When our kids enter her presence, it changes everything. I mean, she drops whatever she's doing. She's never too busy to acknowledge the presence of Benjamin and the presence of Whitney. That's why they feel cherished. Psalms 103.13 says this, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. He cherishes you. And let's close this afternoon with letter B. Treating children with respect. Treating them with respect demonstrates that you cherish them. In other words, children are often treated as second-class citizens. Uh, you know, they're just so young. They're so small. They're not going to, you know, they can't do this and they can't. Do you know a little infant who's two and three? The way an infant learns is through feelings and through nonverbal. Though the baby isn't saying anything, that child is picking up everything. Matter of fact, science has proven they pick up all kinds of feelings in the womb. If there's chaos, if there's violence, if there's emotional disturbances outside, that baby uh, Tanya's getting ready to give birth. Whatever has happened in their home outwardly, it impacts that little one. We know that. Your respect for your child is reflected in when you, how you pick them up, how you hold them, how you bathe them, how you dress them, how you feed them. Uh, Krista, I, I've seen, Krista has four children, and she's in a lot of different ministries here at church. But when one of her children approach her at church, she acts as if that child is the only person that exists. And you can see it on their faces. They know they're loved. They know they're accepted, but they know that they're cherished. That's so important. Ask yourself today, do you feel cherished by God? If you do or you don't, most of that is set up by how you were treated by your family of origin and how you're treated now. Cherishing of a child often is not felt by our children because it's so easy to point out the wrong. Johnny comes home and he took a test that had 30 problems on it and he got 27 out of three, out of 30. He comes home, mama says, 27? That's fantastic, son. The dad goes, what about the other three? What happened there? That's kind of how we are, right? Uh, I used to coach. Rocky's a coach. I used to coach, and I tried my best to stay away from making judgments. I like what John Wooden, uh, one of his practices, if uh, the player was double dribbling the ball, Wooden would take the ball, he'd, he'd go, son, you're doing this. Okay, that's a foul. You, you have to give the ball up. I want you to do this, and he'd dribble with a hand. You're doing this, I want you to do this. No judgment, no negativity, just simply this is what you are doing. I need you to change your behavior to this. That's the same thing for us, that when we go to communicate to our children, that we don't shame them, but we demonstrate that we respect them. Discover what your child can do. What are your children's gifts? What are their talents? What are their abilities? Give them plenty of recognition, but I want to encourage you in this as I close. The most important things that you can reinforce is when you see your children demonstrate loyalty, when you see them demonstrate faithfulness, when you see them demonstrate kindness, selflessness, generosity, thought, thoughtfulness. Uh, if I haven't said this, I'm going to say it again. If I have said it, please forgive me. But some of your children, uh, I've just heard more stories of how they're including our guests. We're in a good growth mode, and we're seeing people come, and they're having children. One of the most powerful things you can do is, when I can hear, is when I hear, you know, Megan or Anna or one of your children actually 
made room for another child and included that child. Because let's face it, if you're five, six, seven, or eight, and you're new in a class, what's the most frightening thing? Are they going to accept me? Or are they going to reject me? And are they going to turn me out? We know little kids can be really scary. And it's those kinds of things. So parents, when your children do things like that and you let me know, I go to them. And I'll say, hey, Johnny, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm just really, really proud of you because I heard that you took a little child that was by themselves. You included, you asked them to come and sit with you. Man, that's being kind, that's being gracious, that's being loving, that's being like Jesus to them. Way to go. Great joy.